I understand I also stand in front of uh, someone else's uh, iftars and uh, it's, yeah, sorry guys, so let's, um, um, let, let's get started. This, this talk is, um, I'll make a, make a big pause so we can then cut it off from the video. So as if it's like nothing happened as if I wasn't talking yet. Okay. <laughs> cool. So again, thanks, thanks for your attention. Uh, this is the second talk and it's a catch up uh, update for the release of uh, Delta Lakes, the technology that was open sourced about a month ago at Spark AI Summit in the US in San Francisco. Uh, we'll talk about um, the essence of uh, uh, Delta. Delta has been available on uh, Databricks uh, for almost two years. It's been uh, battle hardened uh, and industrially uh, in industrialized in production use cases across a lot of uh, our customers. It was actually uh, incepted as a technology on uh, request of Apple. Apple is uh, known um, as a company that does not share their brand with uh, startups or like with even large enterprises usually. But for us, they made an exception and even went on stage in a keynote speech in uh, uh, beginning of 2018 in last year's summit when they actually announced their use case and they talked how Delta helped them accelerate their data pipelines. And they moved uh, some of their queries from um, order of uh, tens of minutes, uh, literally like 25 uh, to 42 minutes were the different queries. They moved them to sub 10 second queries with uh, Delta. And uh, we made this technology um, available, uh, open sourced it. It's on GitHub. You can find it uh, on delta.io, um, the lending web page with all the documentation. And uh, it's fully available in our community edition. Community edition um, has a fully featured uh, uh, Delta. Uh, uh, functionality with the additional perks like the small file compaction um, uh, and the uh, optimization with Z ordering whatnot. Uh, this uh, deck uh, and this recording uh, uh, will will use. Uh, it's not really a deck. This talk uh, will use a small sample notebook. Uh, you can play around with it on Community Edition. It works. It's uh, quite just a toy example. Um, and uh, feel free, if you need any additional support, uh, reach out to myself on Spark uh, Slack SG on our Slack channel for Singapore Apache Spark Meetup. Um, but uh, yeah, go ahead, play around. There are lots of examples. It's pretty cool technology. Before we dive into the details, um, into the notebook, just as a reminder, what actually was overall the case at, at Apple and uh, therefore at like thousands of our customers on Databricks uh, uh, that use Delta. Uh, the idea is uh, we've been collecting a lot of data into some, um, um, uh, the, there was a very sticky f uh, term called data lake. So uh, we were collecting as companies a lot of data for a number of years and that data uh, was uh, enriched, transformed using Apache Spark. Everything was perfect, everything is great, but now actually it's not only about the collection of data and transforming it, it's about making sensible and quick uh, business outcomes out of it on demand, productionizing, um, productionizing these uh, uh, results of your machine learning training into real-time uh, streaming applications, uh, making predictions that impact day by day the way your businesses work. And uh, for that, you need to have a close collaboration of uh, both the data preparation stages, the data engineering stages, and also the uh, machine learning, the data science uh, proceeds out of that data. And when I say close collaboration is uh, without, um, uh, without uh, really great, clean, hardened data, machine learning frameworks are not able to work. Uh, none of the machine learning frameworks have uh, capacity to transform data like Spark does. So the problem is the uh, majority um, of um, um, of uh, the uh, intersections, uh, they come to human beings being in two different teams. And uh, some teams in production, for example, um, or, or, or some teams in application change the schema of the data type or do some breaking changes to the, to the application. That impacts the data. The pipelines, therefore, are using uh, wrong inputs and you end up with machine learning pipeline I told breaking or you need to go and talk to some other colleague or they will ask you to raise a JIRA. So it doesn't really help um, uh, get the innovation going in the companies very fast. So um, what are the kind of two broad categories about the, uh, about the reliability um, and, and performance? What are the great, what, what are the kind of like themes in, 
uh, in the data that we captured and they are maybe very close to your company maybe you are not at that uh, stage yet but this is what we uh, we observed maybe uh, maybe you can give feedback um, uh, to what, what we're missing but what are the kind of like bold themes themes in reliability um, when you have a job that was updating a data set and it fails you end up with a corrupted data set especially if you're using uh, parquet uh, or uh, parquet is uh, at, the, at the moment like a de facto standard it's like very 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 highly adopted uh, format to store um, to store large amounts of data in the data lake so if you update uh, if you if you write data to parquet job has some problems you end up cleaning your parquet manually or you have to create some uh, stubs some scripts some automation to revert the transaction there is nothing that parquet itself adds to prevent its uh, pre prevent its uh, um, uh, prevent this from happening um, another um, example I already mentioned it is schema enforcement so downstream from your uh, data set there could be multiple applications uh, that refer to a particular column as like uh, a location for example like the uh, last uh, the second last column or something like that just it's a, it's a very lame practice to do so but just imagine you do so and then all of a sudden your upstream application changes schema of your data set by adding additional dimensions adding two more columns all of a sudden your reference is lost and you're not able to make any sense in your downstream application of what happened or um, it, I'm not speaking about a sabotage event but like sometimes developers are not really clearly communicating how they're changing the schema of the data set again Parquet has no capability to enforce it it just will accept whatever is going on there um, and um, the uh, ability to intersect a lot of uh, workloads in terms of locking in terms of consistent view on who is writing who is reading Parquet is just accepting everything so there is no um, there is no correlation there is no manipulation of uh, different workflows so if you have a, a read that happens uh, concurrently with write it's a okay case but you'll get a dirtied out result and you will not actually see what you're asking for um, uh, until the parquet uh, is completely updated however for example if you uh, concurrently write uh, there will be no uh, uh, there will be no control on the concurrency there will be no um, a way to change uh, to, to to see which writer will win over the uh, the data set so there is no control it will basically be a result of luck which is a very bad strategy or a corrupted data which is even a worse strategy so that's uh, uh, th that's the reliability um, uh, we also have uh, some improvements on uh, performance we are not going into this uh, kind of in greater details in this talk but uh, um, there, there are ways to address uh, many problems with performance with uh, Delta format as well so what uh, Delta Lake is is an open source of the technology that uh, was GA'd uh, on uh, Azure Databricks and AWS uh, Databricks uh, a while ago it's based on um, uh, Parquet what it adds is the transactional awareness to Parquet and uh, what, what I mean by that is uh, there is a small literally an additional folder in your parquet table so uh, for those of you that uh, have seen parquet table and I based on the previous conversations and the Q&A of a previous speaker I assume a lot of you have seen the parquet table so in the folder that has uh, um, split files of a parquet you add another small subfolder that is called delta underscore log that is your transaction log and then it adds the APIs to consult that transaction log for um, to understand what is currently happening in that particular parquet um, parquet backed delta table so it's very very simple uh, implementation really beautiful and uh, it's a drop replacement it works exactly well in spark um, it will go upstream into the open source um, uh, spark at the uh, earliest uh, stage it's currently being in jira you can you can track it um, a lot of our vendor um, um, uh, vendor ecosystem members like Informatica, Talent, Embrace, Delta. So they are also working on integrating native uh, uh, native readers and writers. Uh, but it's yeah, it's available. It's a drop replacement uh, um, for Parquet. Very simple to use. So what it does, it basically allows you to um, add uh, transactional awareness to your existing data lake. And uh, we now encourage to call the uh, the new type the formation of the new storage at Delta Lake well just because first we can because <laughs> Delta is a nice word and uh, um, uh, and second one is uh, we're not uh, we're not calling Delta it's not really like a transactional relational database no you don't have to like deal with that it's still a parquet backed 
um, uh, Parky back big data lake. However, it adds very important aspects for you to do new things like a multi-hop pipelines. And one example that we'll see here in this, uh, in this small notebook is like what you can now do instead of moving and copying the data and rinsing and cleansing, what you can now do using a park streaming and you will stream data from one table to another table, almost um, uh, like in the replication log. Also, uh, Delta, particularly on Delta, Delta, data, uh, Delta on Databricks, it enables you to read from MySQL and soon from PostgreSQL. Uh, do the change data capture streaming into your uh, data lake uh, uh, pretty much seamlessly. So if you want more details about that stuff, um, reach out to us, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go through that. So what it, um, uh, what it adds, uh, transactional log is the only additional element in the uh, Parquet uh, table. Like literally it's a folder with uh, some flat JSON files that contain the transactions. Um, that allows readers and writers in Spark to be aware about the transactions going on. So you automatically have, a t uh, you automatically have the ability to do atomic transactions. So you have an optimistic concurrency or exceptional concurrency. So you, you are able to fail a write if there is another write or wait for the other write to fail, up, up to you. Um, what it then, therefore, with, uh, with this ability to have uh, transactional awareness, you are able to safely unify uh, batch and streaming workloads. So while something is getting uh, down into your Delta Lake from upstream, you're able to do batch, infer batch inference on the, this data set immediately or do some reporting from this data set immediately. And um, it's pretty cool. It's, uh, uh, it's the Delta architecture. It used to be a Lambda architecture. You get the sense, right, why we call it Delta. It used to be a Lambda architecture where you have separate streaming, separate batch, a lot of hands work in between them. Now it's Delta architecture, fine. And um, schema enforcement. So th since uh, we are able to consult what's in that table before we actually uh, do the write into Parquet, the readers and writers are able to, uh, you're able to enforce a schema or you can, uh, you can accept a, a flexible schema change. So you can, you can be um, also, uh, you can also configure Delta to behave like a previous uh, generation Parquet only uh, implementation. The coolest thing is the time travel. So if, if, uh, if we go into the details of what we are doing, um, by having a transaction log, we are able to write, uh, to commence writes into a separate Parquet file that is not yet member of the table, and then instantly switch the version of the Delta table once the write is, uh, is complete to that new, newly created uh, Parquet file. So what it gives us is we're able to have the kind of like a latest uh, um, a redirect on write uh, snapshot of uh, the uh, table and you're always uh, able to keep some certain amount of versions behind. Those would be just the parquet files that are disconnected from the current head version of your Delta table. So that enables you to travel back in time. You can clean up uh, behind the scenes, you can clean up the no longer relevant uh, Delta, uh, uh, sorry, parquet files in the Delta table by doing the vacuum command. Uh, however, you can do that uh, like for zero hours and uh, just drop everything without keeping any backups. Uh, we encourage to keep at least like six, seven days of, uh, uh, of backup just in case, but uh, it, it's up to you. You can, you can clean them up as, uh, as needed. That's the travel back in time functionality that comes as a proceed of uh, having the transaction log. That's pretty cool. So um, again, um, delta.io, uh, GitHub has a lot of um, additional resources. You can peek into how it's realized. Everything is in Scala, the usual way. So let me show you a few things um, and then I can, answer, um, I can answer question as they come or like just interrupt me and uh, we can go ahead and uh, dive into the details. First and foremost, this is uh, Databricks, what it looks like. Um, you can see here on the top, it's. Uh, it says demo.cloud.databricks.com. Demo, imagine it's your company's name. So it's basically the kind of individual workspace of uh, Databricks. And uh, with that Databricks, you come with like an isolated space. Um, this is uh, exposed to you through the uh, web browser, but all, everything that will happen, it will be provisioned in your VPC account, in your AWS account, or in VNet if you're doing it on Azure. So everything where uh, we, we're talking Spark clusters in your environment. However, you look at it from the kind of like the, the web UI experience. So when you go into, uh, when you go into Databricks, uh, you have notebooks, you have, uh, you're able to schedule the jobs. We'll go through the notebooks, but you need to have a cluster. So when you create a cluster, I actually already have um, my cluster created here. 
when you create a cluster, you specify the instances. Uh, we can edit a few things. We can assign it to a particular pool. So like if this cluster auto scales, it will actually, there, there is an ability to have multiple clusters sourcing their instances from the pre-warmed pool of instances. So you don't have to wait for the uh, like 60 to 90 seconds of the instance to come up. You just literally grab the already warm instance from the shared pool in between clusters and, and it works. So uh, pools, uh, different versions of Spark are available. Uh, our um, um, our uh, community edition will not give you all this kind of detailed configuration. If you if you're gonna tinker it with uh, um, um, offline, it's just uh, available in the full-blown Databricks edition. But again, um, you can do trial if you want to uh, want to go for that. Databricks uh, community edition will be like six gigabyte RAM cluster total, like a very small one, but um, it's it's fully functional. So once you have a cluster, um, let me run it. I can, um, um, I can shuffle some libraries into it. So some libraries are, you can see that they are uh, uh, defined in here. Library is basically how you point into a particular Maven coordinate or a particular PyP uh, coordinate or for R, for maybe like R packages or R libraries for user-defined functions. You can do cram. Uh, or your own jars, like if you run something internally, that avoids any DevOps, any Ansible uh, exposure or the need to kind of like salt and pepper stuff on top of uh, clusters. When we speak about clusters, we're speaking about standalone Spark. So we don't, uh, our Spark is a, um, a standalone single Spark app, uh, greedy executors that occupy an entire instance. So we do not do any of the to, we ignore the, even if you try to do the tweaks about like how many cores or RAM per executive, we'll ignore it. It's basically a greedy execution. Why? Because our founder is actually Matej Zahari and he does things right. So like he actually, <laughs> he actually wrote the initial uh, version of Spark and he says that since it's ephemeral um, switch on, terminate, switch on, terminate type of compute, we don't need to do all this uh, configuration. We don't need to rely on yarn or messes or anything. So we do our own um, scheduling and it's treated as like Spark for the reasons of Spark. We don't do like any zookeeper deployments, nothing like that. So um, hope that explains. So what we see here is a notebook. The notebook is, um, um, and it's also available for you on the, um, on the, um, on the community edition. Uh, notebook is a polyglot. It's our uh, internal uh, representation of what we've seen um, when Jupyter was emerging. We've seen that it's cool and we implemented our own version of notebooks uh, and we will support like Actually, right now you can connect. Uh, uh, you, you, you can uh, import Jupyter notebooks in uh, pr uh, private preview, or connect our notebooks to GitHub, or import export. But the way we've done our notebooks is check this out. It's actually like uh, almost a, a Google document type collaboration. So I'm in this current. Um, um, I'm in current uh, cell here, and I can say like hello Singapore. Um, comment on this cell, and imagine I'm I'm another guy. I'm just in another tab here in another Chrome tab, but I can see myself editing something and I can go down and I see my own cursor, right? So you, you basically have people working around the world concurrently to create a notebook quickly. It's a polyglot notebook, so you can switch in between Scala, Python, SQL, and many other, uh, many other means. Once you have the notebook created, you're able to schedule it and uh, send it into um, execution on, on time. So that's, that's, that's the whole idea. You rapidly innovate, ideate, and uh, then schedule. So um, yes, it took me exactly that time to talk about our functionality when the cluster is now fully green and up. So the notebook is, uh, notebook is attached to the cluster. Um, cluster, I can, I can take a look at the Spark UI, uh, see like what's going on in the usual convenient Spark, uh, um, Spark history, Spark, uh, um, uh, the, the graphs of the jobs, everything is quite nicely integrated. Uh, also, if the, sp if the cluster, since I told you they're ephemeral, we still keep all these details. So you can come back and review them. You don't need to go into some other folders, uh, into some other um, systems. And also you're able to uh, see ganglia stats integrated. You don't need to leave Databricks environment. If you need to see like how much RAM and CPU you used, everything is enclosed in the integrated workspace. Um, so, okay, so what, what, are we, what are we talking about here? We're talking about building um, a data pipeline with Delta. And the scenario is we work in a company that uh, 
has a lot of uh, IoT devices and we want to make sense out of the streaming data, maybe enrich it or do some batch um, operations on the streaming data as it comes along. So we will simulate this. It will not be, uh, it will not be some external data set. Um, the way we will simulate it is, um, uh, let me, by the way, delete this comment because I think it's lame. And um, I actually, one of the things that uh, I, I referred to you about the Git integration, we have the revision control embedded, but uh, you are able to link it up into Git and uh, do things smartly somewhere else if, uh, if, if, if they need be. So every notebook um, comes with, uh, uh, did I clear it? Let me, um, I think I need to reattach it. It's, uh, it's clear state and result. I suspended a few things and then I do the detach and reattach. It's a SQL, basically the Spark context is established. There's one application, cluster is one app. So when you attach uh, a notebook, is what you do is you in instantiate this particular notebook as a Python one. So you instantiate a SQL context behind the scenes. So you can now start patching the commands uh, using PySpark um, straight out. So let's see, run this um, setup. You can notice uh, it takes a while to do something. Let's leave it because it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it, it, might be, uh, it might be just normal. Um, I'll, be, I'll be not pretending. Um, I'll not, uh, one of the things that uh, happens behind the scenes is I'm referring to a very strange looking path here. Uh, Parquet path starts with slash MNT slash S3 shared and then Delta tutorial and something something. What happens is uh, we have a level of indirection that allows you to connect multiple S3 uh, buckets or Azure blobs or uh, GCP uh, storage, uh, 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 Google storage uh, uh, buckets uh, in one namespace just for the convenience of operation. And it looks like you're working on one giant supercomputer with a lot of mount points. So that will be uh, done with the credentials. You can do it once. Basically you mount a storage once and then on our secret store behind the scenes, we will, we will keep this configuration until you either unmount it or you change the credentials on the uh, underlying storage. So this kind of the level of indirection. With the namespace, this, this namespace, we call it a Databricks file system. It's uh, actually uh, a very thin layer for you to point into multiple mounts. It's, uh, it's, it, you can actually store it, it and it's uh, behind the scenes, it's an S3 bucket as well. It's like a 100 megabyte size by default S3 bucket that has the root of, of, of our file system. You can actually put stuff into it, like upload directly into it. But um, um, the best practice is genuinely to kind of mount the remote locations where you prefer to keep your data and then authenticate somehow by IAM role pass through, by credentials, or by some other means that uh, could be different system by system. Does it also act as a cache? Uh, it would cache, I'm still looking at this running command and I'm very perplexed while it's still running. Um, it would, uh, Databricks would cache a certain, if you do the instances of the i3 type on AWS or the type, I don't remember the type on Azure, that have the embedded solid state drive, uh, it would cache parquet only so that you do not pull the, um, the parquet files over the network every time you're, you're referring to them. Um, that is something clearly not, uh, not making me happy. Let's check, actually, I, I didn't plan to debug it in front of you, but let's take a look. Um, this, there, this is, uh, um, yeah, so this is the uh, first thing to do, is to understand actually why some, this one we need to cancel it. I think it's something on the browser side. It's very, very weird behavior. It might be that, uh, yeah, so the cell, have you seen it actually been running? So what happens here is like, I, I, use, this, um, um, I use this command, the percent %fsls, to point into the uh, indirection, and I end up somewhere on some other bucket. So I'm not in the Databricks file system, it's actually within my AWS account or somewhere else globally. And I can see that I have a parquet table, usual parquet table partitioned by date. Um, 
actually the date is a, a year, year, month, day straight away. And I, I anticipate that what happens is in my internet connection, that this cell is actually not really running. It is actually running. This is something that you really don't ever want to have in public in, uh, in meetups, right? So, <laughs> and that, that, always, that always comes unexpected when you're like, like really humbly wishing like, hey, let's let it all be good, let it all be fine. It's 9 p.m., but um, Allah, right? So let's, uh, let's try again, let's try better. So um, I, will blame, I will blame nothing until I find out what was that. So if I go back into my shard and authenticate, it is running. Let's just create a new cluster. Why, why didn't we do this? Is there a way to find out like, what's going on behind the scenes at this point? Uh, yeah, so I'm looking, at, I'm looking at it right now, as you can see. So cluster is actually started, right? So the, uh, the best way to find out is uh, to see, is there any particular, there was no Spark job. As you've seen, the notebook is the only one attached. And the notebook has, um, um, and the, notebook has the only command, which is in Spark SQL. Uh, yeah, it actually may, might be removing the stuff, but it's not a big thing to remove. I'll just maybe comment out this. So just an idea, I mean, if it is not showing up on Spark, is there any way to check the driver log? But uh, it's actually, uh, yeah, you can do the driver log definitely. So we can do we can do the Spark UI, um, or actually there was a shortcut to driver log straight away. Yeah, so you're you're able to go for it. It's just like I don't want to like I don't want to scroll and and read in uh, in, in this velocity. But uh, definitely you have a Spark behind the scenes, right? So um, I'm isolating what could be done just line by line, and uh, that was not planned. I did not anticipate this fun. So I think it's actually removing something. Variable, I, it's, you would assume that it actually passed through because it was before, right? So it's, uh, you would assume that it would already hang there. Okay, so let's uh, print it out. Whew. This whole session becomes uh, uh, very interesting. Okay, so that works, and that works. It's not, it's not supposed to be a code walkthrough, guys, but uh, since we're already here and we had pizzas and Traveloka gave us some Coca-Cola, and you had a coffee break, so then why not? Like, we'll just accelerate through. <laughs> we'll accelerate through something else. So yeah, variables are good. You might want to sit down with a little bit of back. No, it's, 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 it's fine, it's all right. It's about resilience, right? So we have to proudly then tell our manager, like, my back was, my back was hurting, but I still powered through and I've done it. Yeah, way, way to go, yeah? Sorry? Ah, no, don't, don't get me started. So, um, yeah, okay, uh, it, is, it is weird. Let's attach it to another cluster. This is uh, like, I'm, I'm, it, as it's ephemeral compute, let's just do this. Uh, and it will actually show you how fast it is. Uh, SG demo uh, blah. So let's do the default settings, uh, like spots will be mixed in. It will not cost us much. It will be like one on demand, the rest will be spots. Very, 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 very default. Uh, auto scaling enabled. Yeah, boom. Create cluster. Maybe it's better to do it in Singapore. Uh, this this is provisioned in uh, in West. So in um, in your case or like our customers' cases, they deploy wherever they want. 
the particular, um, the particular region is tied to a particular Databricks account. So you can, you can schedule the cluster to be executed in a particular availability zone and locality principle will be, uh, will be driving the low latency. Um, but you are not able, for the different regions, you'll have to deploy multiple Databricks workspaces. Um, so let's do this. Let's go back to this uh, notebook that uh, given up on me in the unprecedentedly uncomfortable situation. Um, and believe me, I, I test before I come into meetups. <laughs> believe me, please. This is, uh, I'm not asking for many things, but yeah, I actually was in the office going through that. Let's attach it to the cluster that is now being powered up. Uh, where was the blah one? Confirm. So we will lose all state. Cool. So meanwhile, uh, when you when 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 you actually when we're speaking about the jobs, right? So these are the jobs that um, that are submitted either by users or by our API. So you can see like the runs of the job. Like let's take a look at this test job. Don Hill one was run. So you are able to submit jobs, uh, and it will. Um, instantiate a cluster for you on demand. It will bring it up with the configs that you need, whatnot, and the job will have a, a log of the previous execution. So each job here, each, each run, contains the uh, Spark um, UI logs from log, uh, log4j and the metrics from Ganglia. So if I, if I go into one of these runs, I can see what was the uh, definition of it, uh, what actually was um, um, input output or whatnot? Well, this is actually was a very powerful input. <laughs> yeah, but um, what what would then what would be then the kind of the use case? Usual use case is you concatenate. Uh, you either create like a library that you run, like a jar, or you concatenate notebooks. So you schedule one notebook and it triggers either parallel or consecutive execution of other notebooks in a cascade. So that like creates your ETL pipeline slowly, one by one by one by one. Um, so what about this guy? Yeah, yeah it is. It is up. It seems like it's a kind of like a, a cache. Is there any? Is there any w web proxy or something? Is it? Are we under net? Nothing. Clear? No, we never use proxy. This is 2019. Yeah, yeah, good. So it's. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it, it's, I'm just asking, like, it's, um, yeah. it's, it's a bit, it's a bit weak, oh. wicked. Is it? Mm. So it gets a context, schedules it, That's not healthy. Oh, no file, look at it. No file, did I remove it? Ah, wait, it was when I was tinkering with it and I was removing it. it it's already, it's okay, it's already, that means that it's already not exists, so it's, it's fine, it should be okay. Come on, it's a community event. Uh, where are we at? Yeah, yeah, because it goes like you define a you de you define a path. Yeah, I already removed it, so it should be it should be fine. So this should also fail because they don't they no longer exist. Actually, you know what? That wouldn't hurt if we. They already are removed, we proved it. So we, we, we can just bypass it, I guess. So what we've done here is like, um, we set uh, a, a, a data set, we imagine it. We should have just skipped it straight away, right? But like, okay, never mind. We have another five, 10 minutes to finish it. So um, we will generate the data set straight out the, uh, um, the data set, as you see, is a Spark range, so it's like random in the range uh, will create some, um, 
a uh, few columns uh, depending on whether it's div dividable by uh, by two, whether it's odd or even, will have an open and close kind of like sensor data, and then some gibberish uh, uh, gibberish uh, date and time that we come up with, and device ID again, like uh, it will be like a random number. So we will create a parquet table. This is where the um, uh, the parquet path would come handy. So that will be creating. We can see what's going on behind the scenes. It's a regular, it, uh, it's a, it's a regular uh, Spark test. Um, that will write out the uh, parquet into the shared path, the one that we've seen above. It wasn't super quick, but uh, doable. And then next one will be, you see the display here? It's something like a dot show in the Spark context. It's a beautified um, Databricks implementation for the uh, notebook space. Uh, what it gives you, it uh, gives you this wonderful UI that you can uh, quickly traverse through. And you can also switch in between the vi embedded visualization and uh, tabular output. But it's similar to what dot show is, right? It's a similar thing. Um, so let's see what would be the count of um, um, rows in there. But if we group by action, so if we say, um, hey, Tell us what's inside this gibberish data set that we created, the IoT use case. So we have 50-50 uh, because it's uh, like random normal distribution and it's all the events, right? So we have open and close. By the way, you see that there are some like hints. Uh, it will probably recommend you do something based on the performance uh, uh, schedule. So next one, I want to, uh, want to see how the transaction log helps me to mix and match streams and uh, batch uh, workloads in one delta lake. So what I'll do is like I'll instantiate a stream um, that will be um, uh, that will be writing out that will be again like creating it. It's in memory stream, so it doesn't read from anything. The type uh, the dot format rate is a is an option when you basically say, hey, here's a streaming data set, and then within it do this. So it doesn't read from Kafka or from Kinesis or from anywhere. It's just like an imaginable stream. So within it, I'll start generate another set of gibberish that I want to uh, append into the parquet. So what would happen if I write this stream out? So I take the stream and I write it out uh, using parquet into the, um, into the defined uh, uh, table that we already have, checkpointing like all beautiful. And I will do that uh, with an append mode. Um, Databricks has this, uh, again, uh, quite neat visualization. For those of you that worked with Spark streaming, it's kind of a mess to find what's going on. So here you have like how many records a second, uh, and, and it's all, of course, logged. You can come back to it, but. Uh, Is the dashboard available in the community version? Yeah, everything. It's just like you will have a small, very small cluster, six, six gig uh, cluster. So let me do this. Let me see what would be my batch query. So I'm, I'm asking to read from the uh, parquet table to read the uh, action summary and count it, similar to what we've done before. Let's see, instantiate. And we keep on appending to it, right? So this guy appends. Come on, woo, rubbish, right? It only shows open, not even actually able to show closes, and it's not able to make any sense out of my previously generated 50,000 counts because this is how it works. So it's not able to make a match in between two readers and writers and make a full comprehension of the parquet's content. So this is where um, uh, this is where the benefit of Delta uh, can help. So imagine we take the same um, data set, the raw data that we generated, and we uh, write it out as, uh, as it's, a, it's still it's a data frame, right? We write it out using format.delta. This is literally a drop replacement from Spark API, just a better spelling of word parquet, because you have to spell Q-U-E-T, <laughs> right? And sometimes you spell Q-E-U-T and whatnot. So it's, it's just simpler to write, like literally. So you write it out, and also you can have the in-place conversion. So you can actually do the, hey, this is the existing parquet table, convert it into delta. It will basically clamp on top that transaction log folder. And um, uh, similar to writing it out from scratch from the data frame, it will just 
uh, ma make this particular table a data frame. So let's see, uh, we'll do the same thing. So we will establish a, a read um, from it and see what's the count of uh, items inside. Let me cancel just to save some, uh, same, same, save a little bit of RAM. Cancel out this gibberish. So yeah, this is exactly the same content, the sec just the, the drop replacement of the format. So if I now do the write of the stream with the generated new uh, appended data into the delta table, you got to love one of the major features that we have is to make a controllable rotation so it should go both uh, counterclockwise and clockwise on desire of our clients and we were asking for a long time whether it should be in JSON format or in YAML and uh, we cannot agree that therefore we never implemented it so let's see now we're doing the same count but we're uh, writing through the transaction log intersection and we're able to make sense uh, version by version by version of the delta table. And while this is loading, I can show you what the, the table actually looks like with this percent FS. Yeah, so you can see it actually like it, it popped out and it increments it as we as we go. In fact, if I start, um, if I did it in Spark SQL, not through the data frame API, if I did it in Spark SQL, it defined the temp table because uh, SQL, uh, SQL API allows me to subscribe to a stream. I can make it a streaming dashboard. So I can make it a visualization of like 50-50, show, um, show me this kind of like, table but I will not need to refresh it I will not need to rerun it or click update it will be automatically refreshed to me um, on the back so the way that delta table looks in comparison to bar key ah, right it has to be it, it's a, um, a it's the Python world not the DBFS world yet uh, that was in MNT so I need to copy this and I might say, actually there is also, you can, uh, you, can, you can mix and match shell commands. Did I tell you that? No, that's pretty cool. So you can do a percent sh shell, it's a polyglot notebook, and therefore everything that you execute from here now onwards would be on driver. So you can do like ls minus la, and there's a mount point on the driver um, that is called slash dbfs. So we can do something like this. So this is what uh, Parquet uh, this is what delta table looks, looks like. You see the folder here called delta log, right? And again, this is on driver, so it's kind of ugly. I can switch back to the uh, implementation of our DBFS and do the percent FS, but we're still here already, never mind. So these are the uh, these are the, the JSON files, the transaction log files. So all our open source um, all of our open source um, uh, commitment was about what's the format of these JSON files and what are the, when we've given away the data frame readers and writers to, to create them. So if I go and head them, um, I might need uh, to JSONify it, but it basically gives you what was the transaction there. There was like a commit info, uh, what was the device from where, this is what our readers and writers are consulting to, to, power, to power the Delta uh, to power the Delta uh, use case. So that's pretty cool. Now, the, uh, before we break, and I'm, I'll, I'll save you some time, don't worry, I think we're behind the schedule already by 10 minutes. So um, in Delta, there is this new notion now that we can mix and match safely uh, streams and batches, we're able to create something that uh, is called multi-hop pipelines. The easiest thing to think about it is like, the easiest way to think about it is you've already seen the silver, the bronze in the paths that I used, right? So it's the rinse and clean. So you have the raw summary presentation, the usual ETL flow, but you do that without actually having uh, the jobs. You can connect them using streams. 
So you have Spark streaming in between the data sets. Whenever there is a change landing into the uh, source delta table, you are able to do the exact ETL on the latest update to that table, put it into summary, put it into presentation, and then push something into um, a, an always running inference or a dashboard live updated or something like that. So here I define reading from a format delta. This is the trick. So you read from format delta. Like, how cool is that? You read a stream from a database. Mm. Pretty cool. So um, if you kick this off, and there will be some ETL, like you, you, we do, as you see, like I'm doing some group by action and uh, I partition um, um, with overwrite, stream stopped, wait, why, what, how? Delta table doesn't exist. Which delta table? It was from reads, delta data, count, does it exist? Yeah, I defined it. A low delta 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 delta. Check. Yeah, it's a fully fledged delta table. You can see the history. These are the commits that we were doing. Is the stream up? Yeah, stream is up. Yeah, and this is the time travel history snapshots that uh, that we talked about. So if I go uh, into into the Format checkpoint location plus checkpoint partition by complete. Looks good to me. What's going on? Star delta gold path. What's that? Is it defined again? I remember there was this very beginning of our, the very, very beginning of our meetup today. We had some issues with all these variables. It was very annoying, friend. Yeah, it exists. Okay. Query checkpoint. Ah, the checkpoint is dropped. Okay. Ah, the checkpoint is not dropped. Ah, so we need to drop the checkpoint. That's easy, it's, let, that should be doable. Never store the checkpoints inside your Delta directory. I never actually looked at the details of this session. The, the, this should be pathetic if they ran into it in Spark AI Summit. Um, where was that, uh, what was the checkpoint name there? Uh, it was Delta gold underscore checkpoint yeah thank you sharp eyed who was that yeah man good stuff thank you and where was i deleting it <coughs> underscore checkpoint fs ls of course yeah so we need to drop it so what i do is like a ram Path is a folder. Uh, dash. I, I think it's a capital R, yeah. Or R. Hey. <laughs> yeah, keep your checkpoints separately. <laughs> no file. Woohoo! Rolling. Okay. Uh, with few hiccups, we're powering through. That's good stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what, would, what we would do is like, we will end up writing into the new Delta table. Uh, and this is uh, instantiated. How are we doing in executors? Five tasks, quite good, quite lean. Nothing happens, should be fast. And then we will do the load from that table, right? So this is, again, this is a stream from a stream. It's pretty cool. So stream from a stream and um, aggregation results by, because there is a group by thrown in, it also shows you the aggregation stats straight out. And then you do something like this. Nice. 
straight out. So it is still going on with the appends from that IoT use case. And um, that's about it. So schema evolution, a uh, few other cells in here, they talk about uh, uh, how you can uh, merge schema. So if you do the appends, you can actually allow Delta to be flexible about schema. I just don't want to uh, use a lot of your time. But basically, you are able to drop the request if the schema is enforced or actually append if you want to by submitting the data frame extension on the, um, uh, on the option. So there's an option that only Delta will understand, right? Um, asset transactions, um, um, yeah, you can actually do the in-place um, overrides of the schema. Um, time travel, this is actually interesting. Let's do that. Uh, actually... How about I answer a few questions like 9.15? But basically, you just trust me, you can travel back in time, <laughs> right? So, and uh, it, uh, there, were some, there were some hiccups on the way that led us to this, uh, to this question. So in the interest of your time, what do you guys think? This is open source now. It's been battle tested for two years on, uh, uh, on, on Databricks.com uh, in, in Azure Databricks. Uh, it's been uh, incepted by the use case at, at uh, Apple, which was uh, the 300 terabytes a day of data set that was coming from all their network devices. It was the forensics for their networks. And uh, it's uh, acceleration. We, we, don't talk, we don't talk about the performance improvements that Delta brings, like the compaction of small files that are created if you stream into the table. Behind the scenes, you're able to bin pack like into one gig parquet files. So even if you have like a 10 kilobyte parquet is arriving and you have millions of them, behind the scenes, you're able to compact them. You can do data skipping. You can do that ordering behind the scenes. Not possible to cover everything in the session. What do you guys think? Was it worth open sourcing? Is it cool? Looks cool, yeah? All righty. So if you need more uh, info, um, download this notebook, ping me on Slack, on the um, uh, Slack, Spark Slack SG. And uh, there is a lot of tutorials out there, a couple of blog posts, how to do the time travel, how to do the compactions. Check it out. It's straight out working on Community Edition. Just don't bloat it with a lot of data sets. It's six gigs. You can run out of memory. So cool. Thank you guys for your attention. What a, what a horrible day. <laughs> they started at uh, 6 a.m. arriving into Singapore on the red eye. <laughs>